name is Brian McGuire. I was a New York City fireman for 14 years. I was hired in 1999. I got sick in 2012 from 9-11. And I was forced into retirement in 2013. John Field from the Feel Good Foundation puts out a outreach program trying, Tom and I volunteer our time to come out to spread the word to get members who were at 9-11, whether it's the Pentagon, World Trade Center, or the plane crash site in Pennsylvania. Uh, we talk about all three of those because anybody who responded to any one of those three locations is entitled to be in the program. It's not just for first responders. It's also for anybody who lived in lower Manhattan after the towers fell. And if you were a student survivor of that day, you're also entitled to the health care. Tom's going to introduce himself. This is Tom Wilson. Thanks for coming out. Uh, and welcome us here uh, to Dallas. It's great. Uh, it's Tom Wilson. Uh, during 9 11, I was a uh, NYPD sergeant. Came on the job in uh, 1995. Uh, in uh, two, November 2002, went out to uh, Suffolk County, and I'm still an active duty uh, Suffolk County cop. I got to tell you what the World Trade Center Health Program did, to, did for me was. Uh, Back in uh, late 2008, I had a uh, large mass in my tongue, and uh, like many of these uh, World Trade Center cancers, they're very aggressive. Like we articulated in Washington, D.C., the like cancers on steroids. Anyway, I got to uh, have, have my tongue cut out, and uh, but when I was on Long Island, I would go to the, like the community doctors. They didn't. They just put me on antibiotics, they didn't know what to do. Went to the World Trade Center Health Program, one of the doctors there, Dr. Rahm, said, you gotta go into Mount, Mount Sinai in Manhattan. And uh, they knew what it was, and a week later I was in surgery, and it saved my life. And now I'm uh, dealing with the effects of the uh, long-term effects of the radiation, my jaw deteriorating. But I'm still active duty, and uh, that's that. But you guys need to get into the uh, World Trade Center Health Program. We're going to explain that to you. I know a lot of guys, we just told me the chief, this program's so good. There's a lot of guys, like I'll go to Sloan Kettering or Mount Sinai, but there's some guys up in New York that will go down to uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, over in Houston because the, uh, the treatment's uh, superior. And so uh, it's all covered. And uh, we're going to explain it. First of all, <clears throat> you guys came up to help us, and we appreciate that. Yeah. We lost bosses, we lost our lieutenants, captains, chiefs, uh, our commission, our chief of department, our whole structure was annihilated when everybody came to help us. That was big, because for the first up until Saturday, there was no security. The, really, it was a free-for-all. You were just getting on the pile and digging and hoping to find a void or hoping to find somebody alive for up to maybe, I think after 16 days, we finally gave up and saying there was no survivors. Now it's going to turn into a recovery mission, and you were just trying to find some closure for families. So we appreciate you coming up to help. Yeah. So this is our way of trying to get back a little bit and make sure everybody stays healthy. God forbid you're not healthy, you know, we can help you get the care that you need. So this program is just not about New York City. You don't have to go to New York City to get into the health care program. You don't have to see a doctor in New York City. Members from all 50 states from police and fire departments responded to 9-11, whether it was Pentagon, Shanksville, or the World Trade Center. So there are centers in your area, there's doctors um, that will see you that is a part of the World Trade Center healthcare program. So um, one thing I just wanna make clear, we always say the World Trade Center program, but it's also for Pentagon first responders and also for Shanksville. So why they named it the World Trade Center Healthcare Program? It, you know, no offense against the Pentagon responders. Was anybody here at the Pentagon? Everybody was at the World Trade Center? Great, and for, for tonight, we're just gonna refer to the World Trade Center. But if you do talk to anybody, any of your friends, any of your coworkers, you know, this involves the Pentagon responders as well, and please let them know. People see World Trade Center, and when we first started going down to Washington, D.C., they're like, well, we didn't go to the World Trade Center. We're like, no, this is for the Pentagon. They brought that to our attention. So it was a little oversight, but I just want to clear that up. It's for all three terrorist attack sites uh, from 9-11. So 
if you were any three terrorist attack sites on 9-11 or for days, weeks, months afterwards, you're entitled to be into the program. Whether you were a first responder, you lived down there, you were a student, everybody is, everybody is entitled uh, to be seen by a doctor once a year to get an annual medical. From there, if they uh, find out that you're sick, they will certify you with your illness, which means your medications are paid for, your doctor's visits, surgeries if you need. Basically, the only thing that you have to pay for on your own is your gas and tolls. New York City has tolls on every street. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, and then everyone here would probably go through the National Provider Network, because you live outside the metro area, and it explains in the book, the book with the world. WTC, the health program portion. Uh, if you belong to the NPN, the National Provider Network, and you've got to travel 50 miles, they understand you may live in a rural area, they'll actually uh, reimburse you for your travel expenses. Sure. Um, uh, is there a difference, or how do y'all differentiate the difference with like Texas has presumptive loss for cancer that, that runs through um, workers' comp? How do you, are you going to get to that? Okay. This is also a presumptive work site. So if you have any of the, how many cancers? 68? 68. 68. Yeah. If you have any of the 68 cancers, all you have to do is prove that you were at the World Trade Center. And you're going to do that before you enroll into the program. You'll have to get two affidavits, one or two affidavits, fill out a process, and they will get you into the program. So once you're in the program, and God forbid you get sick, you don't have to prove that you got cancer from the World Trade Center. That's what the scientists and that's what the environmentalists did, how they came up with these 68 cancers. And yeah, they, they're just going to ask for your, uh, once you're involved in the program, like Brian said, you're going to prove your presence, whether it's uh, affidavits, your co workers, photos, blog books, travel receipts, any type of thing. They understand now it's 18 years later, you may not have all that documentation. So, uh, again, the affidavits and uh, and then God forbid you do get cancer, like in my case, they uh, ask for the biopsy report, and they send that down. The program is run through the NIOSH, National Institute of Occupation Safety and Health, through the Centers of Disease Control. They send your biopsy down there, and it's a presumption, and you're covered. But uh, like New York State is just going to pass a cancer law for firefighters, it, this goes a, a step above. It's a, it's a federal program. And, and you're entitled in, to many other benefits. Do you have a cancer presumptive bill here, or are they working on that? It's, it's in law. It's, it's in law? Yeah. Okay. But they still, just like anything, sometimes they approve it, sometimes they don't. Okay. Is it a five year? I mean, because you're, like in New York, they just pass it. You have to get the cancer, I think, within five years of retirement. Is there. Is it a sunset provision? Or? I don't think uh, it is. We've got an assistant chief that's going through it now, and his is all accepted, so his is all going through workers' comp now, but he's still on the job. So. But a lot of the cities find it the workers' comp portion. Well, and the was he a well trade center responder? Yeah. Okay. Well, the good thing for you is if a city fights you on this, you have this to fall back on. Mm -hmm. Or you're guaranteed with both, however the cities want to find it. Absolutely. And this is a high, I, I, I should have brought it from my house. This is the actual, we have certification letters. Once you get certified, it, it, it's memorialized through the World Trade Center Health Program. It actually shows you certification. Rhinos tinnitus, GERD, the type of cancer you have. PTSD, that's a big one. And uh, you actually have the certification letter. And Again, you show that to your job, you know, they should, they should be covering you. It's, a, it's, a, it's the federal government through the Centers for Disease Control. You know, it's a, it's a higher threshold. Yeah. So this program is run through NIOSH, which is part of the CDC. And that's how we're gonna start enrolling everybody into the program. We'll give you a phone number later. But like you said, you find out you're sick, you send all your paperwork to NIOSH, they certify you once you're certified. All your bills are now covered and paid for. But we will get a little bit more in depth with that tonight as we go through the slides. So this is from 2018, so the numbers I'm sure are much higher. Um, 
what they say there's 93,000 people? Yeah, we have a pool of 93,000, that's first responders. And I remember going back to County DC when we were educating Lobby, I would articulate there was 6,000 cancers. Now this time around when we were pushing for the, this bill to be authorization, it's 12,000 cancers. So it's, a, it's growing exponentially. Certified cancers. As time goes on, there's gonna be more cancers coming. The biggest cancer yet to come from the World Trade Center is the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. It takes 18 to 22 years to manifest in your body. They're saying that's going to kill a lot of first responders. So some of the big cancers aren't even here yet to uh, you know to start affecting us. Yeah, and all that asbestos came from a particular mine in uh, in Montana. And 80% of the people that live in that town in Montana, I forget the name of it, we have all the asbestos that was uh, inserted into the Trade Center back in 1972. 80% came down with the cancer. The big one is yet to come. So there's uh, three different categories uh, for people that would be put into the program. The first one is general responders. Well, let's start off with the first responders. First responders, not even FDNY, police, fire, EMS, uh, USAR teams, police departments, fire, EMS from all over the country that came. You are considered a first responder. The general responder is more or less for the people who were cleaning up um, during the recovery recovery phase. Electricians, steel workers, um, any uh, any kind of union that was here to, that that was there to help remove debris from the pile, they are considered general responders. <clears throat> survivors were people from that day that came out of the buildings. And survivors is also from a certain portion of Lower Manhattan. If you lived or went to school south of Canal Street, you were entitled to be in the program because when that when the buildings fell, the buildings went down, the dust went out. So they also include the people who lived in that uh, in that certain radius as well. We'll show you a map in a minute just to give you an idea of how much of Lower Manhattan is covered. So 18 years later, people moved away. People are living all throughout the United States now. I mean, I have an idea, and if you just happen to meet somebody or know a relative, you can say, hey, you know, there's a possibility you may be covered. You know, get a hold of the uh, Feel Good Foundation and see if we can get into the program. So these are just basic numbers so as of 2018. There's up to 93,000 people now, and there's probably over 100,000 or more, not an additional, but I would say probably 110,000 people that maybe responded to 9-11. So the numbers are pretty good. We have 93,000 covered so far, but we're still doing the outreach program to make sure people get in and get monitored for their health issues. So once you get into the program, this is what the program covers. I said it uh, kind of quick already before. Doctor's visits, you don't, have to, you don't even have to pay copay. Any medical testing, if it's a lung test or uh, blood work, and x-ray, all your medical tests are covered. Surgeries, I had uh, sinus surgery back in 2016, my surgery cost $71,000. I didn't have to pay a penny because the World Trade Center Health Program picked it up. If I had to pay for that out of my pocket, I probably wouldn't have a roof to live over, you know, because I'd be worried about paying my medical bills. Prescription drugs, my drugs come in the mail. I have to call every three months just to get them renewed, but I don't have to go to a pharmacy. All I do is pick up the phone. Hey, I'm running low. My three months are about up. They come right to your door. You don't have to drive and worry about it. There's absolutely no out-of-pocket cost hey, hey, for anybody. Some things that do happen if we didn't have the World Trade Center Health Program. Your co-pays and <coughs> all your other medical expenses. Say some of your uh, health insurance only pay 80%. You're responsible for that other, and it comes out of your pocket. Here, it doesn't, and I think that's big. Finally, the government's taking care of us. Finally, I say, which is not a, a good word that we should be using. They should have taken care of us from day one, but now we have it. So let's take advantage of it. Let's make sure we go get tested once a year for our annual medical. So uh, the three categories, the three or four categories that we saw a few slides back, 
the first responders, the police, fire, and EMS, whether you were active or retired at the time, what happened in New York City, all the retired firemen, they saw what happened, they all came back to work. Uh, they were volunteers, but they were retired and they were considered a first responder so that even they were covered with the medical health care. Um, health workers, nurses and doctors ran down there figuring there was going to be thousands of people who needed help. We all saw there really wasn't anybody who needed to be, you know, who needed help other than the people from the initial collapse. Uh, everybody who got caught down in the, uh, in the blocks around that got the dust, that got knocked down, that got pushed from when the, the wind was blowing after the buildings fell. And uh, the volunteers who assisted in the rescue, recovery, and cleanup efforts. Uh, the recovery and cleanup effort went until May 31st of 2002. So if you were there from anywhere from 2001 to May of 2002, you're entitled to be into this program. Yeah, eligibility, like I, I said before, you're gonna be, you'll be part of the, uh, the uh, provider uh, network since you live outside the uh, metro area. So there's a phone number in there that'll uh, tell you about the uh, provider in the uh, health program uh, brochure. The exposure zone for the uh, first responders Every, everyone here is a first responder because the survivor is a little different. It's south of Houston Street for the health program. For us, for the first responders, it's south of Canal Street, all the way down to the Battery, or uh, I did some time at Fresh Hills Landfill, uh, or if you were at the morgue, and of course, as Brian said, the uh, Pentagon and Shanksville. Those are the uh, sites uh, down there. Uh, the barge floating piers, uh, Probably the hospital, the morgue, they have tunnels. Are you familiar with what they were doing with the debris, taking it from Manhattan? Mm -hmm. Put it on a truck, they drive it to the river, they put it on a barge, they push the barge across the Staten Island, and at the Staten Island landfill is where they would sift through. Um, yeah, there were two assignments there. I would get a grid, probably uh, size of it, this room, half this room here. 10 yards by 10 yards. They give you a medical, metal, metal rake, you probably have in your shed, and a uh, bulldozer back hole would just dump through the debris, and then you just shake, go through that grid, and then you were handed a uh, five pound spackle bucket. If you found anything of a demon value, you put it in the spackle bucket, and there was a uh, crime scene trailer, and they would talk a little later. Or the other, we go under a canvas tent, and uh, there was a conveyor belt and a sifter would put debris on the uh, conveyor belt and you would just sort through it like this. I always say, I've been interviewed many times, it was like uh, with the I Love uh, Lucy episode where she's sorting through the chalk. It was just like that. You find something of medium value, you put it in the uh, spackle bucket. Unfortunately, there wasn't many things that were found. But uh, Fresh Kills Landfill is also one of the uh, <coughs> exposure areas, along with the, the entire route along the way. It was, it was that toxic. Was everybody here just strictly in Lower Manhattan? Was anybody operating in a ward? No. And no, was anybody at the Staten Island Landfill? No. Okay. Here's that map I was talking about. That's the map for all the residents who live south of like now or Houston? Houston, Houston. Houston. Houston for the survivors and one and a half miles. That's why you see Brooklyn covered. This again, this is for survivors, residents, workers. So it really doesn't apply to us. It's uh, but if you know of somebody, and, and and that's the way it works. You you may be at a family barbecue and, and someone will say, Are oh, you down at the trade center? Was, you know, oh I lived down there at the time, I was going to college, whatever. And then that's how a lot of this happens, and we'll get a phone call and uh, get you in the program. So yeah, that's why Brooklyn's also covered there. It's a one and a half mile radius from the, the Trade Center site. That's the way the smoke shifted. When the buildings fell, the smoke went towards Long Island. Probably half of Long Island should be covered in the healthcare program, but it's not. They stopped it in Brooklyn, like you said, one and a half miles. So. 
that little swoop that you see into Brooklyn, that's where they decided, all right, we're going to stop there, and anybody who lived down there, you will also be covered in the health care program. Nobody who's here was in the Pentagon, right? Did I ask that question already? Okay. Um, we'll just give a brief, quick talk about it. That way, if you happen to run into anybody, you can tell them, oh, hey, I was here this night at the presentation, and, uh, you know, you're, you may be eligible. So, um, from September 11th until November, November 19th, 2001, that is when the search and rescue and the recovery efforts at the Pentagon, the Pentagon ceased uh, in the middle of November. So if you were there November 28th or 21st, you were, they deemed that that area was cleaned up and safe by then, and uh, you were not eligible for the program. Uh, same thing with Shanksville, uh, that's where the plane went down into the field. Uh, there are uh, first responders from Shanksville that are sick with 9-11 ailments because uh, you had the jet fuel, you had the burning, you had the debris. Unfortunately, you had DNA floating in the air, you know, when the plane crashed, so some bodies kind of just pulverized, so. Um, anytime after October 3rd, you're not eligible for the program because they deem that area complete and safe if you walk through on the next day. How you apply for the World Trade Center Healthcare Program, we'll give you a phone number at the end. You're going to call one of two people. Her name is Keisha, or his name is Reggie. I'll give you phone numbers at the end. You'll call them and you'll say, I, you know, I was at a 9-11 healthcare presentation. I am not in the program. Please send me a packet to fill out. They will send you a packet. It's uh, pretty good. You just have to fill out the questions. They will ask you for an affidavit or two. That is a witness who you were down at the World Trade Center with. That's good. Because if I'm asking him to fill out a piece of paper for me, my next question is going to be, are you in the healthcare program? If not, hey, you have to see this book that I got. Let's go out for a drink one night and I'll tell you what they talked about at the healthcare program. So that's one step better to bringing somebody else into the program because you definitely need that affidavit in order to be put into the World Trade Center Health Program. Once you get all that paperwork done, you send it back to Washington, D.C., to the NIOSH building. They go through it. They'll put you into the program. Uh, sometime later, you will uh, be given a location and a day to go get your uh, World Trade Center medical. That'll be your, your very first one. Um, they'll do blood work. They'll do a PFT. Maybe they'll ask you some uh, mental health questions. Hey, PTSD yeah. is covered in the program. Uh, a lot of people have problems with it. This is a rough month. I'm not going to say a week. It's a rough month for everybody. Always leading up to 9-11. So, um, everyone that responded and everyone went with somebody, no one, no one went alone. So whoever you went with, hopefully they're still alive, you're still in touch with them. Get together, call the number uh, Brian's going to give you, and also page 21 explains it pretty good about if you're outside the uh, metro area. But get, get together with the crew you went up with, and uh, again, the affidavit's good enough, but also pictures you did together, whatever documentation you have. But get together with that crew, call the number, and uh, you gotta move, you got to move along. If you don't want to be here, in front of your mirror one day and you see a lump in your neck and now you're not in the program, now you're going to be behind the eight ball because now you got to go through this whole process. You don't have to be sick. That's the biggest misconception. People say, oh, I have to be sick to be in the program. No. You want to be in the program, number one, to be monitored, but also, God forbid you get a cancer. Now that cancer is a number that supports all the other cancers. Like I had a head and neck cancer, and it was just a study done by the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Hospital down in uh, New Jersey through their set, center of excellence. Because of all the people getting head and neck cancers, they're able to prove that the head and neck cancers are 40% increase for 9-11 responders compared to the uh, general population. So your illness will actually go, as John Field often says, we're like guinea pigs. We're being monitored. And those numbers support each other. So get together who, who, with who you went with and get in the program. On page 25 in the World Trade Center member handbook, 
It tells you about your initial health evaluation, uh, your exposure assessment, how long you were there. They want to know that to see if people were only there for a few days or for a few weeks or for a few months. Who's getting what? Uh, the blood test, the chest x-ray, the, EK, the EKG, your medical history and a, a mental health questionnaire. We talked about the PTSD. Uh, you'll do a physical exam, uh, the breathing test, a urinalysis, and vital signs. But you know what? This just They're not just looking to see if you're sick from the trade center. God forbid they pick up something else from you. It's another doctor that has a set of eyes on you. So if you don't go see your family doctor once a year, you're still seeing a doctor. And hopefully uh, they don't pick anything else up. And, and don't worry about split heads, how long you were there or not. Because everyone's immune system is different. There, there's people that were there for one tour, got devastating illnesses. There's been people that have been were there for months and months and not sick at all. And, you know, everyone's uh, immune system is different. 203 New York City. No, I'm sorry, the number changed. We just had five guys die last week. 208 New York City firemen have died since 9 11 due to 9 11 cancer. Unfortunately, we're the lucky ones that we're still here. So it's very big that you get monitored. Their bodies were different than ours, their bodies got sicker than ours. So everybody's body's different. So it's really important to stay in this program. This is mainly for New York. We really won't beat you up on this. This is just some of the places, uh, the center of excellence, uh, some of the places you would go if you were sick. I go to a different place than Tom does. I was in the FDNY. They have their own monitoring group. Tom, where do you go? I go to Coleman, Stony Brook Medical Center. So these are just some of the locations for the New York City members. What applies to you is the, the last one. LHI. That is who uh, you're going to be dealing with when you when they call you to set you up with your doctor's appointments. And if you're sick, they'll set you up to go see your specialists. Uh, it says uh, in the little parentheses on the right-hand corner, there's over 800 treatment providers. That number has jumped since 2018. More doctors are getting into the program. I don't want to say why, but it probably has to do with the payment. But it's good because it's expanding. You want more doctors. You want more, you want more people having eyes on you. So would you rather go see a doctor 35 miles away or a doctor three miles away? Because he just figured out that this program, you know, is, is getting to where it should be. And it's been in the news a lot recently uh, with the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. Well, now it's about that time where everybody remembers 9-11 until after September. So... Doctors want to get in, it's good. You know, I'd rather go three miles than have to drive 35. Once again, the first responders uh, compared to the survivors. Um, you go once a year for your exam. Your illnesses get certified. Uh, your initial health evaluation. It's different than the survivors. We were there much longer, the survivors were running out that day. All the rescuers were coming in for weeks and months at times. So we have more exposure uh, than maybe some of the survivors. But don't forget, the survivors went back home probably two, three, four weeks after, and then they lived at home again in their apartment downtown, which never got cleaned properly. So they may have been more exposed than us being at the pile, because all of us were here at the pile, but they were eating, sleeping, breathing, showering, sitting at home, on a couch, still in that contaminated area after uh, probably about three weeks after about 9-11. When you, uh, very important with the initial health evaluation, when you get that first appointment, and let's say in 2004, you went to your primary doctor because you didn't know about this program, and you went for some kind of sinus, sinus condition, or sleep apnea, GERD, or uh, you have uh, opaque scarring in your lungs and you have x-rays that show that back in 04, bring that with you to that initial health evaluation and it'll show that you had those injuries within the five year period of when you responded and you'll end up getting certified for those, those conditions. So if you have documentation through your primary doctor back years ago, up to recently, 
make sure you have all that, especially with the, you know, radiological data that, that can prove that. Or even if you've got antibiotics for, you know, constant pneumonia, bring that to the, uh, your initial health evaluation. So we'll talk about like the environmentalist, the scientists figured out about these 68 cancers. So now that they know that there's certain conditions that were covered by 9-11. There's also just not the cancers that are covered. Um, they do a lot of studies. Uh, they it, it, right now the big ones are uh, in, interstitial lung disease again. You got an extra, I just got a, uh, I saw my x-rays over the years. Shows constant, open, what they call ground glass opaque scarring in the lungs, it just gets rid. So interstitial lung disease, cancers, and uh, new onset COPD are the, are the big ones now. I'll just give you an example, some of the other illnesses uh, that you may have, and you may have them here and not know about it. I tell my story and people are like, oh, I get bronchitis. I get it like two, three times a year, and I'm like, that's how they got me and I didn't know. Um, chronic bronchitis is a 9-11 illness, you wouldn't think. Uh, asthma, reactive airway disease, COPD. I'm, I'm probably sure nobody has COPD here because we probably wouldn't be working today in the firehouse or in the EMS station because your breathing is uh, can get really bad. Um, GERD, uh, heartburn, anybody ever chew thumbs quite often? That is a 9-11 illness. And these are just some of the few that you would never think that um, that is covered by the healthcare program. Anybody ever get told they snore? I'm proud of it. <laughs> Sleep apnea is a 9-11 illness. They will pay for your uh, for your uh, CPAP. CPAP machine. Thank you. They will. That is that is a certified illness. Those are those are just some of the basic illnesses. Um, runny nose, post nasal drip. That's all considered sinus issues because. The dust either got on your skin and went through your body that way, or you breathed it in through your nose or your mouth. Those are just some of the, I'm just giving you ideas of what's all covered with the uh, World Trade Center Health Program. In the book, in your uh, World Trade Center member handbook, it really goes into detail about uh, a lot of the illnesses that are covered with their special terminology. All right, so we're actually coming up to this next slide, which is what I was just uh, saying. Uh, he talked about the lung disease, the respiratory issues, asthma, reactive airway disease. Reactive airway disease, for those of you who don't know, uh, you go into smoke, you start feels like your lungs are tightening up or uh, a chemical odor will kind of trigger you. It's kind of like an asthma attack. That's basically what reactive airway disease, your airway is reacting to some kind of contaminant that is inside of your lungs. Uh, COPD, uh, somebody um, in the very beginning, they called it the World Trade Center cough. You coughed for about three months at a time, they gave you some pumps of uh, Pulmicort and it went away for a little while. So uh, some people to this day still have that annoying cough that they never could get rid of. Um, GERD, sleep apnea, laryngitis, uh, problems with your nose, problems with your throat, upper airway disease. Those are just some of the few. And this is just airway and digestive disorders. We're not even talking about any cancers. Uh, you want to talk about this one? Huh? Yeah, mental health, actually I just uh, had a talk with a, a gentleman in my department that I transferred to, we just lost three members. And the cop that uh, had to compile all the paperwork to uh, submit to the state to uh, get them as line of duty deaths, he was a 9-11 respondent. So as he's going through all these death certificates and all the documentation from the uh, widows, it was a trigger. So he called me the other day, and uh, that trigger set him off. PTSD is a big one. And once you're in the program, I, I know uh, with Tomac, we call them the pink forms, it's probably about 20, 25 pages every year. 
you fill out the uh, psychological portion. And uh, if you need counseling, uh, it, 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 they're a great program for that. I know in the uh, New York City Police Department just this year, I don't know if the, the media has uh, given any attention out here in Dallas, there's it's been, it's been nine suicides. Nine suicides. Six of those suicides, six of those officers uh, were 9-11 uh, responders. I'm not saying that's why they committed suicide, but they were 9-11 responders. So it's a, it's a big issue. And uh, I know as the years go by, it's becoming more historical. I take a lot of pride on it, but it, there again, there's a lot of triggers, and also you see, you're coming, everyone's still working. I work with people now, because I'm still active duty, uh, just getting off field training. They were eight years old on 9-11. It's kind of frustrating, you know, especially dealing with the millennials. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they don't know what it's all about. So I, to me, it's a, sometimes it's a, a source of frustration. But uh, I'm still working. I have certified uh, condition PTSD, and uh, I don't go see anyone for it. My therapy is the, uh, the gym, and I have a great family and a support structure. But there are a lot of people that uh, take advantage. That, that's one of the great strengths of this program is the, uh, the uh, mental health portion. So uh, you'll, you'll be taken care of if you need to be treated for that. Something. When people have a problem, some kind of mental health disorder, sometimes they go to the bar. You're going to drink your problem away for the night. Sometimes they're going to resort to drugs. We had a random drug testing, so we were all scared to get drug tested. But that is one of the issues that is covered under the World Trade Center Healthcare Program. The IAFF, the, Internet, or the National Union, does have... Um, center of excellences that will help you with these programs if it ever comes down to it you you really wouldn't think uh you know drinking or drugs will be considered in a world trade center healthcare pro, pro program but everybody deals with their issues one way or another and sometimes it could just make things worse you don't want to see a guy lose their job because they snorted a line of coke because this is a bad month for him so we're glad to see that that is also uh, covered in the healthcare program. Any injuries that you had at the time of working at the Trade Center, you can't say, oh, my back hurts me now, 18 years later, you know, it's got to be from the Trade Center. If you were hurt at the Trade Center at the time you were digging on the pile, just to give you some examples, any burns you had, any sprains, ankles, you know, any kind of uh, muscular skeletal injuries, any fractures, you broke a leg or bone down there and, you know, it doesn't work how it did before, uh, head trauma, any other kind of uh, issues that you had when you were working at the Trade Center. But it has to be before September 11, 2003. You can't, you can't just say, oh, you know, I had a cut, it's in the same area, it got affected, they're telling me I'm gonna lose my arm. It doesn't work like that. This had to be documented in order for it to be covered and taken care of. Um, John Field, who founded the Feel Good Foundation, it is a 9-11 uh, first responder and responder organization. The first Saturday after 9-11, and I wanna say it was the 16th, it was a Saturday evening, he was, um, there was a supervisor for a demolition company. A steel beam fell and chopped part of his foot off. Situation like that, he had an injury at 9-11. His foot was amputated. That's just an example of how this portion of the healthcare program would cover him. He's still having issues to this day. Uh, how many surgeries did he say he has? I think he got up to about 70. 70 surgeries. To this day, he's still being covered for his injury at the World Trade Center, but it was documented. You know, without documentation, you will not have anything covered now. Uh, you know, I was talking about my back hurt. You know, uh, you can't say 18 years later your back started hurting. You know, it's from the Trade Center from digging on the pile. We do things every day that could make us 
that can make us, you know, be in pain. So if it's documented before 2003, it's a chance that the 9-11 uh, healthcare program will pick up your, your injuries. Okay. Can we talk about the answers? Yes, yeah, so this was a hard fought, fought one. The science caught up with all the scientific studies. And these are the certified cancers now. And it, we, I, we say 68 cancers, but in there is a, a rare cancers. So just, just about every cancer is uh, covered. And uh, mine's up there. Well, I got two of them. Uh, but the main one is tongue. And what I want to explain about that is also in the booklet, I don't know if it's going to be on the next slide, what's also covered, just like uh, Brian was talking about John Field, He's probably getting covered under what they call medically associated covered conditions, meaning he loses half his right foot. What happens? He kind of overcompensates with his left his left leg, so he has to get his, his, his hips are all fucked up. In my condition, I'm, I have now covered uh, back in 2017 severe pain in my jaw. Anyone ever see the marathon man with Dustin Hoffman when they they're torturing him, drawing his tooth? Uh, you know, is it safe? Is it safe? in that scene in the movie. I had to go in my backyard. My wife was there. I had to yell out in the woods because the pain was so severe. What happened was I had head and neck radiation. Cancer radiation destroys everything it goes through. The mandible, the jaw, is weak bone to begin with. They found out I had a massive hole. It's called osteoradionecrosis. And uh, I brought all that all the medical documentation from my oncologist, the head and neck surgeon, plus uh, also uh, medical literature that supports that radiation causes uh, bone damage. Anyway, that was certified as medically associated. I just had surgery that was covered this April to uh, repair my uh, jaw bone and remove that teeth, that uh, tooth with, that was uh, lying on my trigeminal nerve, which is one of the more painful nerves along here if it's touched. Those are the cancers that are covered. A big one for men, there's 15, uh, I know when we were down in D.C., there were 15 male breast cancers, and that, that's uh, statistically is unheard of. World Trade Center responders, males with breast cancer. Well, again, the cancers, I remember going to a funeral, a guy, a guy had nasal cancer. You know, how often do you hear nasal cancer? You, you got it, everyone was there, man. You, you remember what that breathing, all that crap was like. And uh, those are the cancers that are covered. And uh, there are latency periods, but no one had cancer here, so we're beyond those latency periods, so God forbid you get cancer them all, you're covered. So I'm not even gonna discuss the late, latency periods because we're way beyond that. The longest latency period was for the uh, mesothelioma, which was 11 years. So those are the big ones now, the cancers that are coming up. Again, like I said before, we're up to 12,000 certified cancers. On page 30 of your 9-11 handbook, uh, it talks about some of the cancers. Just gives you an idea of a little bit. So um, just because, I don't know what half of these words mean, <laughs> fireman proof is on page 30. I can understand that a little bit better. Believe it or not, one of the biggest cancers right now in the New York City Fire Department is skin cancer. 2018, we had 593 New York City firemen who responded to 9-11 with skin cancer. It's a very big issue right now. Um, they're pushing us, they're not pushing us, they're recommending we go find a dermatologist on our own. You go there, head to toe exam. They know what they're looking for. I had a little thing over here on my side, I was like, nah, that's, nah, that's a mole. You know, it's a birthmark. I'm like, well, it's ugly. Can you get rid of it? It doesn't work like that. But they know what they're looking for, and they're very good. Um, anybody, everybody here, I recommend you go. Go find a dermatologist that takes your medical um, prescription plan coverage. And if it is cancer, once you get registered, it would transfer into the 9-11 healthcare program for everything to be covered. But if you have a cancer now, it's only going to spread. So you can start doing preventive maintenance on your body by going just to go see a dermatologist, just to get a check from head to toe. It's, uh, 
it, it could definitely save your life. Yeah, I had it. That's one of my sort of findings. I had the most sort of it. And with the cancers or all of these diseases, it's, it's, the criteria for the presumption is either has to aggravate, contributed, or actually caused. So ag aggravating the condition, meaning like when I go to my head and neck guy, Dr. Jen, great guy, everyone in your office is 75 years old. So, yeah, maybe I would have got that cancer at 75. But we call synergens down at ground zero and first goes landfill, aggravated it and accelerated the process. So you gotta keep that in mind. It just doesn't mean, oh, you got cancer, it was 100% caused by it. It could have been just aggravated by it. That's how toxic, toxic the environment was. All right, we talked about the mesothelioma. It takes 18 to 22 years to show up in your body. We're hitting the 18 year mark uh, next Wednesday. Wednesday. So, it's coming. Some of the cancers that they are looking at that are not yet covered under the World Trade Center Healthcare Program, they are studying and they probably will be adding a handful more of cancers along with uh, some illnesses that more people have attributed that were 9-11 first responders and responders. Um, I know with PTSD, we were talking about PTSD, a new study just came out recently, a correlation between 9-11 responders with certified PTSD and heart conditions. You know, it has to go before a program, what they call the STAT Committee, and the STAT Committee has to compile all this evidence and they make a determination whether a condition can be certified or not. Like peripheral neuropathy, for years they've been trying to get certified for the 9-11 responder community, and it's been denied over and over by the staff, the staff committee. So uh, again, yeah, continually trying to get conditions added, but a lot of them have been uh, denied. Uh, some of the big ones right now that are under study and hopefully are gonna get uh, approved by 2021, is uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, neuropathy, uh, Raynaud's disease, the tingling, tingling and numbness in your fingers and your toes. Um, what does Rob Sarah have? Uh, Not the sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is covered. I'm trying to think. It'll come to us. But um, so if you get sick and it's a rare illness, and you are in the 9-11 healthcare program, report it. Because there may be a study going on right now and they'll add you into that study, or they needed one more person to start a study, and now you're that one more person to start it to see if they can add the issues into the 9-11 healthcare. Uh, this goes to talk about the exposure a little bit. Um, some of the other places other than the ground zero, uh, the morgue, which I think was in the exposure area. It was near the... Uh, near yeah, originally it was by the Burger King over there, by Liberty, Liberty Street, but then eventually moved uptown. So any, any of the morgues, different morgues, then it went to Chelsea Piers, and then eventually up to Bellevue. So yeah, if you happen to be there, like a lot of corrections officers work uh, at the morgue. What they're learning is where you were, how long you were exposed, and what your uh, what your ill effects are now. They're still trying to figure everything out to build a better picture of to how many more people are going to get sick compared to when, where they were, how long they were exposed. Uh, the latency periods. Uh, you had talked about that for a second. Yeah. yeah. And we'll go more into that. I uh, just said, uh, God forbid, we got cancer tomorrow, it, you're all covered. You're all past the uh, latency periods. Um, you know, we have to look into the, you know, the, the two that passed, you know, we were discussing earlier. But, uh, yeah. And uh, so we're, we're all covered. We're beyond those latency periods for the uh, cancers. Okay. Now, the, the time intervals. You see the air, our digestive? That's what I was talking about earlier. When you go to your national provider, a lot of you just having GERD without another uh, illness, it's past the five years. 
So you would have to go, if you went to your primary doctor back in 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, you complained of uh, a condition that would be covered, get that documentation, and it shows you, you fell within the, uh, in the uh, interval of time, the maximum time interval. That's separate, the latency period is, we're beyond that, but the interval of time, you had a five year window to have that illnesses. So, your primary doctor, your, your work doctors, if you have it documented, that's what I, going back to what I said, that initial uh, health checkup you're going to have, bring all that paperwork. Here's a big problem. 18 years later, people move on, they pass away, they retire, you have no way to get some medical records. Another option would be, uh, what are your pharmacies down here? Do you have CVS, mm -hmm. uh, Wal Walgreens? You, worst case scenario, you could go ask them for your copies of the drugs and medications you got back in 2005, six or seven or eight. I just went and got my last three years worth because I just had to go see my doctor uh, probably like a week or two ago. So I brought him all three years to show all the medications that I was on and you know what the doctor's name was. So that would be paperwork if you're having a tough time getting some doctor's reports from 2000 and early 2000s, that's another option for you to have. Or it could be a, a tertiary, you could, for example, I was struck by a car and then it back to the Stony Brook Hospital while I work. Had complete body scans, so I wasn't there for a 9-11 reason, but during those body scans, I look back and it shows uh, lung scar. So you, you might have been in the hospital for something else and you had a CAT scan. Look over those CAT scans, read it. It may show that you have damage to certain areas that may be related to 9 11. So, in order for you to be into the program, there are certain time periods for how many hours for a certain amount of days or if you didn't reach the first uh, four or five days. So for example, the 11th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you only had to be at ground zero for four days, but we all surpassed this presentation right here because when you went with the USAR team, you were deployed for 14 days at a time. Did anybody stay for more than 14 days? No, 14 days and you swapped out with another team? Well, actually, when we, we demoted, it was the day uh, Y'all decided to make it a recovery mission versus a rest mission. Okay. So, so that was our demobilization date. That was what about? Six? It's like the 26th of the okay. yeah, we're yeah, we were we there for 10 days between, after the 15th, so between the 15th and 30th. Yeah. Okay. 12 hour shifts. Four hours, four seconds, four minutes, we were at the trade center. Everybody bought, everybody's body is different. But, they came up with these guidelines. So we have to follow this in order for people to be eligible for the program. Um, 208 guys are dead because their bodies couldn't handle the dust and turn into cancer compared to us who are still alive today. Doesn't make any sense. But unfortunately, we have to follow these rules in order to have somebody in the 9-11 healthcare program. So these are the specifics for the Pentagon and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. A little bit more different from the World Trade Center because the World Trade Center took a lot more time. Um, you had to be there for 80 hours, and that was more or less for the uh, 80 hours from October 1st to July 31st of 2002. That was more or less for the recovery workers coming in, the steel workers removing the I beams, and uh, the people sifting through and trying to clean off the whole lower Manhattan area. So that's why you would see uh, a big difference in jumping hours. So tier one, two, and three, does that do anything for you when you're getting condition certified? Does it make it easier to certify a condition? Does it matter? I mean, why is it labeled tier one through three? So tier three has the most amount of hours. So does that mean they- Severity is yeah, some they, they show that you're exposed more and um, so no, it's, uh, if, if you allow me to answer that, it's just the coding of the health program. 
Um, tier three is the tier that ha that requires the most exposure hours. But the reason for that is that that those are the people who are present, breathing in the air, the lo after the longest time after 9/11. Sure. So it's just the way that they kind of categorize the people because the requirements are different. So for somebody who was there on 9/11, all they need to be is caught in the dust cloud. Right. That could have made 30 minutes. But those are the people who really were breathing in the jet fuel as it was coming. So it's just different tiers. And for every tier, it's a different requirement. But it's a way for the health program and the victim compensation fund that I'll talk about later to differentiate between the different types of exposure. It doesn't mean that uh, somebody's condition is less severe or more severe. So it's a factor they use in considering your admission into the program, but not necessarily something that affects the way that the claims are handled or processed. Not at all. Not at all. It's just you have to cover the hour exposure criteria to be eligible for both the health program and the victim compensation fund, but it doesn't mean you're getting more or less treatments, more or less pain, more or less compensation. Yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You just got to be fit to be in the, in the program. You got to remember, you're going to read in the booklet. The World Trade Center Health Program conducts studies and whatnot. This is probably for their, their, their studies, their medical studies, and things of that nature. I, again, I reiterate what I mentioned before we're guinea pigs. We're all being. But to get in the program, correct? You just got to need this. Yep. Need that. To get in, and that's, that's why we're here. And uh, another thing with the tiers is that, particularly because that's the, the part that's relevant for you all, uh, for the World Trade Center, the tiers also represent the proximity to the crash site. Mm -hmm. So tier one is pile. Tier two is probably security per perimeter surrounding ground zero. Tier three is, say, the people who lived in that area or the people who went to school who are still exposed but were a little bit geographically further away which is why their hour requirements are also higher. Good answer. Yeah, I'm still there from now. I was trying to figure out what it is. Where does it say you get homework now? I was like, all right, so much, so much. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how to explain it. Yeah. I'm a little slow, that's why I was a farmer and I broke windows for a living. Okay. Here. So there's different terminology. In the very end, in the very back of this book, I believe there is a glossary. It goes through all the definitions and everything. It helps you explain it better. If you don't understand something, like we call it the pile. We know what the pile is. You say that to a civilian, like, what's the pile? What are you talking about? So everybody has their own terminology. There was different terminology for the Pentagon compared to the Trade Center. They didn't call the Pentagon the pile. They call it whatever they call it. I don't even know what they call it, to be honest. But um, everybody's terminology is a li little different for the, uh, for the three locations. But it doesn't matter which one you were at, you were still getting sick. And that's the most important thing. <clears throat> this just gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of numbers. Now, don't forget, this is back in 2018. Uh, from certified conditions. They're saying that everybody who is at the World Trade Center has some way, shape, or form of PTSD. It's the time of year you get sad, something triggers you, you watch a video, you get mad, you want to go kill somebody who came over here and killed our friends and killed two of your team members. Everybody's got a form of PTSD from 9-11. Um, so I'm sure that these numbers have risen. Um, well, definitely the cancers have, because people are getting more and more sick. So, just giving you a basic idea. Um, back in 2000, and, what was it, 2014 and 15, when we were going through, there was uh, at least 30,000 people with one form of 900 illness. Now, it's way junk. More people are still getting into the program, so the numbers are climbing higher as people learn about this program. They get tested, they find out that there's something wrong, now the number goes up. They're spending a lot of money giving doctors uh, 
gave the doctors a lot of money to do more research and to do uh, programs and to do studies. That's probably never going to stop. What Tom said, we're guinea pigs. Something like this has never happened before in the United States. For the next terrorist attack, or God forbid something else like this happens again, <clears throat> they already know what's going to come. Uh, back in the early 2000s, they said, eh, about 10, 15 years, people are going to start to get sick. They were right on the money. People started getting sick for 10 years. People started dying. So they're constantly still learning about this because it has never happened before around here. And you gotta remember, we're, we're a unique group in that other prof professions, they don't have to go through, we all have to go through a physical, correct? To get on our job. The strength was physical. And then go through some type of training or academy. So we, we were all very healthy at one time. And and this, this took place. I had to run five miles in the fire academy every day in the New York City Fire Park. I hate it. <laughs> I can't even go up two flights of steps anymore without having breathing problems. <clears throat> so it really changes your life. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to give you uh, two phone numbers now. Does everybody have a pen? Everybody's got a book, so I recommend <clears throat> probably write it in the front cover of the book. Write it also somewhere else because if you lose one, you have the other. <clears throat> I mentioned two names before. Uh, one person's name was Reggie. And I always keep this on my phone because you never know. I don't leave home without my phone, so I always keep this around. Reggie's number is 202-491-1252. I'll read it one more time. 202-491-1252. Or you're going to call Keisha. 404-498-1252. 2529. I recommend having both phone numbers because if one doesn't answer the phone, you can call and harass the other one. I didn't say harass. Second one again, please. Second one uh, is Keisha, 404 498 2529. So basically, what you're going to do, you're going to pick up the phone, you're going to call one or the other and say, Hi, my name is so and so. Uh, I was from uh, Texas. Task Force One. I was just at a 9-11 healthcare program. I am not enrolled. And would you please send me a packet so I can enroll in the 9-11 healthcare program? They're going to send you a Manila folder. Questions. You'll have to answer um, any documentation that you have. You have pictures. You mentioned pictures down there, right? Yeah, pictures. Yeah. You have any pictures of you at the pile? Um, any awards you received back home, any newspaper articles showing the team coming home and you know them them praising you for all your hard work down there. Um, well, a lot of folks saying that you were sent or airline reservations. Or uh, Brian mentioned a good one that you know uh, you, you tell the doctor uh, he was talking about the prescription stuff. You know any any type of supporting uh, documentation. That's all going to help. It's just going to make it easier for you to get into the program. Don't send them your original photos. Things get lost. Make a copy. Send them the copy. Send them a copy of the newspaper. You know what? I don't mean to cut off. I remember somebody was able to prove proof of presence. I know cell phones were rare then. I remember getting issued one, but if you made phone calls, cell phone calls, or even uh, landline calls, and you're able to get those right, you know, that, that's another way. I remember somebody was able to uh, verify your proof of presence through. Uh, you know, uh, cell phone calls. So. But You're very fortunate. You went with the task force. They will have records yeah. in their computer. Uh, we just did Colorado two years ago, and it was great. The guy who actually had the records was sitting and listening to the presentation. So I'm like, everybody go harass him when this is over. He has the most important information you're going to need. So. So far, we've hit uh, we've hit three or four task forces. We were at the managers meeting in March in New York City when all the task force leaders came, and we're trying to hit all the other task forces. Us being down here for the stair climb, this was a no-brainer. I have a feeling we're going to come back because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven people here. But you going out and spreading the word. Um, who is not in the program? 
one, two, three. Okay, you three are in, um, but keep it, keep the momentum going with telling everybody about this program. Don't forget, you have to get an affidavit signed. You're gonna ask that guy, are you in the program? Let's go out for a beer. Let's look at this book that I got and let's talk about it. Tell them uh, people are dying every day. So it's very important to get in here. Our main goal right now is to stay alive so we can be with their families. Do you agree back there? You to... <laughs> I'm not sure if she agrees, but sometimes I'm a pain in the butt. But hey, it is what it is. Um, but seriously, uh, we need to stay alive for our families now. More than before because it's only going to get worse. And, and like Brian said in the opening, we're, we're, we're eternally grateful for you coming out there. Yeah. Really. Our worst time, you came to help us. And we're, we are forever in debt for that. So now, I remember guy, I would be on a traffic post, say on, uh, on Canal Street, and somebody from out of state said, hey, hey boss, take you and your guys, go to ground zero while we take this traffic post. And they were from, you know, somewhere outside New York. I said, hey, I, I, you know, at, at residence. Appreciate it. And, uh, and, and we're seeing it right now. You know, some people aren't here now because they're going to the Carolinas. You know, that's, that's our business. We, you know, I know in my profession, law enforcement, there's a lot of negativity, but uh, at this staff I'm going to, uh, I, I have a shirt, uh, uh, Stan with Dallas. We're going the, uh, the five uh, cops that were shot and killed. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood, and uh, we got to stay together and get in the program. So, so a lot of us on the task force we went are registered. Uh, some of our biggest issues are, I don't know if we can help with them, is the doctors down here don't know what to look for or even how to write it up. So I, I, you know, I, I got certified for my lungs uh, years ago. And you know I got covered and stuff, but I got I was registered and then it switched to LHI. Things got lost. I had to get recertified. Uh, but when they send me to the doctor, it's just a, a workers' comp doctor. He he sees most of the people in Austin, but he he doesn't know how to. He doesn't know what he what to look for. He doesn't know what to write up when you are sort of or have something. Uh, you know I've got three or four of these things on here that I'm not certified for. Okay. And I just don't know how to. Well, I, 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 I would take a trip to New York every year if I could just see a doctor who did know what to look qualified for how to write it up. We have this problem a lot. Okay. Um, so I now live in just outside of Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philly. I'm pretty close with a lot of Philly firemen. You won't believe it how many phone calls I get. Exact same problem. Sure. I said, all right, the day before you're going back, call me. I'm going to tell you exactly what to say to the doctors okay. so they can write up your paperwork to make it very easy for when your paperwork gets sent back to LHI and it has to go get certified through NIOSH. Okay. There's keywords in there. Okay. So we will definitely be talking. But I have to do this with every member because in New York City, all the doctors know 9-11. Right. They're not stupid. They're in the healthcare program. They know they're going to be getting paid. But they actually care and understand how the program works. So. Down here, that doctor, you may be the only 9-11 first responder that he's seen, and, he, and I get it, I understand. How many miles away are we from New York City? So, uh, over a thousand, I guess? Absolutely has no idea. He's trying to do the right thing, but he just doesn't know what to say or how to write it on that paper. It's more like follow the steps, okay, we have to do this, this, and this. And they don't care about the end result. That's how it is in San Antonio. That's why I kind of stress with there's three criteria, aggregate, contributed, cause. A lot of doctors get caught up, oh, did this, did 9-11 cause this 100%? That's not, that's not the threshold. Mm -hmm. Try to get it, listen, it could have, it aggravated this thing, my curve, whatever. So I, I would try to, you know, stress that, but Brian would guide you through it. Yeah. But also, I, I know with my certified conditions, I didn't even want to debate my private doctors. I want the diagnosis, and then I give the paper, the diagnosis to the World Trade Center Health Program. And I, I don't know how it works with the LHI, but yeah, like you said, you would, you would travel up to New York. I mean, the centers, the, the centers for excellence. Again, because 
your doctor, my doctor, they don't know 12,000 respondents have cancer. Who knows that? The World Trade Center Health Program. So. Well, yeah. LHI, how they're going out and eliciting doctors who are willing to do the World Trade Center physical by this criteria. Okay. That those guys, that all it is is we're going to run them in, run them out. If we find something totally out of whack, then we'll address it. That they're the way they're I feel, not they're them. not they're not responsive to what we may be encountering. I mean, my, my physical doctor I see every year, the one for the World Trade Center physical, I told him three times that you know, I've got these two things, and they're uh -huh. like, oh, we'll just come back next year, we'll see what's gotten better. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where we pick up the phone and we make a phone call. Okay. So if you ever have any problems with any person that you're going to go see, LHI wants to know this. Yeah. If they're not cooperating, they, been I've, asked, I've asked them numerous times to trade from who I'm going to to somebody more competent. And they said, well, this is the guy we have under contract. And they worked with me, so my respiratory doctor wasn't a one of their doctors, and I, I got him to be a certified doctor. He had to fill out some paperwork, and uh, so now he's certified with them, and I can go with no problem. I think my appointment was been really uh, But it's, it's hard to find a doctor, because I don't know how they find it, LHI. I don't know how LHI finds a doctor. It seems like they just Google do a Google search for <laughs> your zip code. No workers' comp. They punch in a certain mile radius around your zip code. First one that pops up, there you go. There's your doctor. I'd, I'd love to talk to you for a couple of hours about stuff. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is the uh, pulmonary test. You know, they're, they're, they're very big into the pulmonary yeah. test. They want you to pass the pulmonary test. I mean, one time I did it, they actually gave me a Bronco inhaler before the test. They, I'm like, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not finding anything out. We're, we're kind of cheating the system. Cheating the system. And, and I mean, I pass it all the time. I could have probably passed without the inhaler, but it's just in our locale, and I'm, it sounds like Austin is the same way, and I don't know, San Antonio just has issues. With who they use is, I mean, we have 12 or 14 responders that were on the team in the San Antonio area. Yeah. Is there, a, I mean, are the facilities in New York for those, the, the flagship places, are those available for them to come there? Can we go to New York twice a year for care? Yeah, the way I read this is that I can actually, you can transfer over, but the way I read it, I can actually transfer from my clinical center of excellence to the national uh, program. Hearing your experiences, no. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but I, I've heard of people that moved from New York and retired down to Florida, North Carolina. They, they said what you just said. Once a year, I go back up, take my wife to Broadway, I go to, uh, and I go for my medical. Yes, you, you can transfer over. When you, when you call, say you, you want to do that. And also what I, I might recommend, I know what other people do, when, they, when you know, you mentioned workers' count doctors, same, it's the same nationwide in New York, they're for gazy, okay? Go, go to a good private doc, pulmonologist, That's and now get that documentation, and that, that'll support your case even more. And you know, I mean, you're gonna have to go through your own insurance for that, but now you're gonna have that, that'll just make your case even stronger. It's based on signs, symptoms, and testing. <clears throat> can't lie about that. You I can lie about your signs and symptoms, but your testing is ultimately going to prove that you're not lying. True. So I think there's a little bit of concern that there's things that we might not notice that get you know missed in blood work because you know they're within tolerances, but they're an indicator of something to come that we want to be really aware of. Mm -hmm. and, and the doctors down here don't see many, if all, any uh, patients that, that they would be looking out for. So. You know, it's kind of the equivalent of, you know, having something major and going to see your family, the care doctor, who says, you know, here's an antibiotic for that. Um, I guess, you know, one of the concerns is, like you were saying, <coughs> that with the um, asbestos, mm -hmm. you know, we're at the 18-year mark, and that's where the asbestos, asbestos starts <coughs> occurring in, in the cancer rate for lung. You know, I guess, I mean, the only thing they do is the pulmonology test and the x-ray. I guess the x-ray would start showing scarring and all the other stuff. But. 
if they see something with the x-ray, then they do the MRI. Yeah. I know I had to get an MRI because my x-rays didn't show something good. So that's just the primary because they're not going to send you for an MRI right away. They want to make the cost as least as possible to them. And then if they find something, then they will do the next testing. Well, one, um, one of my World Trade Center phone schools, I was doing the 12 lead, and they said, oh, oh my God, you know, you have such an abnormal heart rate or this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I went to my primary care physician and they ran a 12 lead. They said, you're perfectly fine. So it's just. Do you need Well, um, the best thing, Frankly, really bit to transfer. Um, I, I mean, I was going to introduce myself later, but my name is Maria. Um, last name we're going to solve it. Don't worry about it. Maria is fine. Um, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I'm an attorney. I'm one of the lead World Trade Center attorneys. Hold on, <laughs> commercial break. Does anybody want to snap? Yeah. New cycle. I'm not the only one having the same issue. So let me just tell you, LHI is not perfect either. Yeah. We've had complaints against them as well. I mean, it takes what, 16 And if you do have complaints, pick up the phone and call me mm -hmm. because I call Reggie a lot. That phone number that I gave you, LHI is not getting back to people when they're trying to get their medicals rescheduled or they've been waiting five weeks to get an appointment with a pulmonologist. I pick up the phone and I call Reggie. Reggie, it's Brian McGuire from the Feel Good Foundation. We're having a problem. It's getting delayed five weeks. He gets the ball rolling, or I call Keisha. Usually I deal with Reggie because he knows me. He knows my phone number when it comes up on call. Right <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, what's wrong now? I'm like, hey, hi, nice to see you too, you know? But just saying, LHI is not perfect either. So ever you ever have any issues with anything involving the healthcare program, pick up the phone, email us, call us, and we'll pick up the phone. I've had to deal with the Pennsylvania Task Force over 20 times with problems with guys, and all it takes is us sending an email or picking up the phone. I like calling Reggie. He doesn't <laughs> like it when I call him, but I call him, and it gets fixed. But the Pennsylvania guys didn't know this, and that's why they called me. I'm like, all right, no problem. We'll take care of it. So we want the feedback. We want to know if there's a bad doctor, good doctor in the program, um, stuff like that. Okay. So she's going to introduce herself, talk about the Victims' Compensation Fund, and then we'll finish up with another 9-11 Foundation and we'll explain how they can help as well. All right. So good evening and thank you for coming. And even though I've already said it, thank you for your service. As I said, my name is Maria. Um, I'm a lead World Trade Center attorney at the law firm of Barish McGarry. You have a brochure there. You have my card in there as well. Um, so how is all began um, back in 2000 back in the early 2000s after 9-11 uh, my firm had a client detective Jim Zadroga he was MIPD first responder at ground zero and Jimmy passed away he was still in his 30s in 2006 from pulmonary fibrosis now, how does a 30 year old 30 some year old cop pass out from, uh, pass away from pulmonary fibrosis so young Upon insistence that an autopsy is done, um, it revealed that his lungs were filled with ground glass, benzene, jet fuel, and this triggered all the community efforts and our law firm's efforts into uh, passing the, what is now renamed, but the original bill was the James and Drogon 9-11 bill. Mm -hmm. Now it is um, the Ray Pfeiffer of ours and Droga, Never Forget the Heroes Act. But the, the initial bill was passed in 2010, and it has two prongs. One of them, as Tom and Brian um, greatly explained, is the World Trade Center Health Program. The other one is the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, which I'll explain to you. Um, so upon the passing of the bill in 2010, it was available for five years. In 2015, we fought uh, the community together, um, fought and extended the bill for five more years, um, which also made the World Trade Center Health Program permanent. And the biggest victory was this past July uh, when the, the drug bill, the Never Forget the Heroes Act now, was permanently extended and we funded not only for the health program, but the victim compensation fund. What that means is that 
the budgetary committee only gives the budget for the victim compensation fund for the first 10 years, but between now and the next 10 years, there are over $10 billion available from the government for people like you, for responders, for survivors, for people who just lived in the area, went to school in the area, office workers in the area. For example, my office still is and was back at that time right across from Ground Zero. We've lost people, we have partners with cancer, um, so that's one group of survivors as well. So basically the reason that the programs exist, not only the health program that provides free health care and treatment, but the victim compensation fund that gives you compensation for your pain and suffering, economic loss for loss of the job, or um, compensation for the families of the deceased, that entire thing exists because people were lied at that the air was safe at ground zero. And it's no secret any longer that this was done so that the stock exchange can be open. Now, after so many years, the government acknowledged their faults, and that's why the money is available. Now, I'll go through the biggest reasons why you need to file a claim once, and hopefully that never happens, but once you get certified with an illness. Uh, but for now, let me start. I'll touch upon three points the guys already covered, but I'll try not to repeat myself a lot. The first thing you need to do, whether you're sick or not, get two affidavits, two, which is two statements, as you already know, from people who saw you working at Ground Zero or whichever, or whichever area you're covering. They need to include those, those eyewitnesses' information, contact information, phone number and address, um, and also the particulars of when they saw you and what were you doing. And they need to be signed and either notarized or um, written under, or including the language, I declare under penalty of perjury, or I swear that what I'm saying is, uh, is true and correct. Now, the reason why I'm saying is get those two documents is because if you want to apply for the health program or for the victim compensation fund, you need them. And I see this every day. I've been doing that for years. I've uh, been at the firm for a long time. Um, is that the more time passes, the harder it gets and people are finding it impossible to get in touch with somebody they worked with 18 years ago. And that's reasonable. So whether you're sick or not, whether you're even contemplating of going for the program or not, get those affidavits. That's the biggest and most important advice I can give you. And from that on, follow the advice that Tom and Brian gave you. Enroll in the World Trade Center Health Program. You don't have to be sick to do it. Go for your physicals. The best advice I can give you in terms of LHI versus uh, the metropolitan area is I do as well get questions from clients who are not happy with the national provider. If it's possible for you to make a trip to New York once a year, do it. Um, now, keep in mind that the centers of excellence in New York are very, very packed. So you might want to make that call, see what their availability is. If you need immediate treatment, um, it might not be the best option because, as I said, there is a huge wait. But if your conditions are somewhat under control and you can wait and make the trip, do it. Now, if you're already certified and you are applying for compensation, now that's what the Victim Compensation Fund does. Um, if you have other conditions, you don't need to get them certified. I can help you get compensation for your other conditions without getting them certified and kind of go around the health program. Uh, but basically, um, what you need to know about the Victim Compensation Fund is that once you have a certified condition, and again, there are exceptions to the rule, which is why I really recommend getting an attorney. Um, not that you can do it yourself, but there will be a lot of obstacles on the road and most likely you wouldn't be optimizing the situation. But either way, once you um, get certified for an illness, or you have an illness that is either one of those 68 cancers, any of the upper or lower respiratory conditions, um, GERD as well, when you have that illness, you are eligible to receive compensation for your pain and suffering. That's the first type of claim. And then, you know, 
unfortunately, a lot of people went out on disability, one type of disability or the other. They were forced out of their jobs because of their 9-11 illness. Now, while New York has a World Trade Center bill that covers cancers or heavy pulmonary conditions that put a lot of PD and FD out of jobs or put them on disability, even if you, your state doesn't have such a bill, if you are forced out of the job because of a cancer or because of a interstitial lung disease, for example, the VCF will still recognize that and that will be the second type of claim, economic loss claim. This is when you lose your job because of your 9-11 illness. Whether your job states it's because of it or not, it could state it's just because of pulmonary fibrosis without linking it to 9-11. That's where we come in. We link it to 9-11 and you, you're made whole again. Basically, whatever you receive from disability will be deducted from whatever you were supposed to make to the end of your career and you receive that balance. So the purpose is, it's not an award, it's a compensation, it's reimbursement, it's making you whole, but it's really saved a lot of people who were forced out of their jobs early and are no longer capable of working. Now, the third type of claim is actually the wrongful death claim. And I really urge you, even if and none of those things apply to you, um, we've already realized, you know, a lot of people who either lost a loved one or sick themselves, please take brochures, please tell them, please spread the word, because it's very, very, it's particularly hard to reach the families of deceased responders, because they're not in the union, they're not hanging around, they don't get the news that you guys do. But the bottom line is that once, you know, the person is deceased, obviously the health program doesn't apply to them anymore. So, the victim compensation fund still does. Um, what happens is their next of kin, whether it's their spouse or children or brother, sister, parents, whatever the case may be, are eligible to receive compensation for the personal injury, which is the pain and suffering of the now deceased, as well as a wrongful death claim. That is obviously not enough to cover what they've been through, but it's help to the family. And um, there are certain statutory limitations applicable. Uh, for example, it, the statutory limit is bringing a case with the victim compensation fund two years from the date of death. Mm. However, there's a way around that again. Mm. <laughs> That's what, there is an appeal process, a hearings process in place, which is what we do to help people. Because, you know, a lot of first responders passed away a few years after 9-11 and their families are just hearing about it now. So we have still tried and found a way to fight that and still get them compensation. Now, as far as personal injury goes, for the ones of you who are certified, you have to register with the Victim Compensation Fund two years from the date of certification. If you haven't done so, you're technically time barred. Again, there are ways around it. Um, and the other thing to know is that even if you're certified for something right now and you've missed that two-year deadline, one, there's a way around it, and two is if you get certified for something else in the future, that brings back the entire thing. So if you got GERD in 2011 and next time you go for your physical, you now have asthma, you can bring, bring a claim for compensation for both, as long as one of them is within the two-year statute. And, um, the other thing that I wanted to stress that um, Tom and Brian kind of already touched upon is the skin cancer. Um, the health program doesn't cover skin, screening for skin cancer, but it's very important you go for it. Um, I had a client actually a few years back and I was giving him his uh, compensation check for whatever conditions he had. And I always tell them, hey, go get your skin check. And he was Italian, all his skin. He was like, yeah, okay, whatever, Maria. And I'm like, no, seriously, go. He went because he had some spots here he thought were something. Turned out they weren't, but the doctor saw a discoloration under the pinky nail. And that discoloration turned out to be advanced stage melanoma. He got his, the tip of the pinky amputated, but saved his life. And bottom line is, you have. Well, how would you ever notice that? <laughs> and you know, it could have been too late. If he hadn't done that, he might have already 
you know, not being with us. But either way, get your skin checks. Doesn't matter what color skin you have, whether you're light like me or darker, go get it. And the other very common conditions are the breathing issues. And actually, uh, we have it simplified, the covered conditions right here in your folder. It's sort of a simplified list. It's everything breathing related you can think of. To put it simply, acid reflux, sinus issues, and then pretty much every cancer you can think of. Um, as the guys already said, the latencies for cancers were pretty much past that. But when it comes to how early it could have been diagnosed for them to be related to 9-11, then that's a different question. However, even if somebody was diagnosed, say, with um, pancreatic cancer, three years after 9-11, as opposed to the statutory limit of four, there are still ways around it to show that the cancer <coughs> was indeed linked to 9-11, uh, where they might not be eligible for the health program because of that limit, but they will still be eligible for the victim compensation fund. Um, the special master of the fund, uh, she has the authority to make decisions that go beyond the health program. Now, she's not gonna give you health care if the health program rejects you, but she can still award compensation once you have to prove the link, of course. So, the skin cancer is the most common among everybody. Um, breast cancer among both men and women. Prostate cancer, very common with men. And uh, lung cancer because of the breathing. But all those cancers show up very frequently. So really, in one the health program, stay on top of your health. And the one thing I want you to know is that even when people get sick and get certified, some of them tell me that they don't want to file. Why? I usually get three big reasons. The first one, which is very, very noble, is I did my job, that was it, I don't want to take other people's money, I'm not dying, I just have asthma, I want to leave the money to the people who are really sick. I touched upon that at the beginning. A dollar for you is not a dollar less for anybody else. Now with the fund permanently extended and refunded, there is money for everyone. And also, every case is different. Every case receives different compensation based on the circumstances. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you really only have asthma, you're gonna receive less than somebody who is dying of cancer. But you're not gonna be taken from anybody. Again, the entire fund um, is in existence because the air indeed was not safe. And you're not taking that money from anybody else, you're taking it from the government that owes you at least that much. If you don't need it, take it and give it to somebody you think needs it, give it to charity. We've had members give back to the fire department because they don't want the money, but it's something you're entitled to. The other big reason is that people think it's a lot of work. Now really, the only thing that is work on your behalf is getting the proof of presence. Um, because you know, I don't know who you were there with, I don't know who saw it. But beyond that, we can help you with everything. We can help you with the health program, we can help you with the VCF, we'll do the entire process for you. The proof of presence is really the only thing. Everything else, as far as conditions go, is either a presumptive legal link or something that uh, we do as attorneys to prove the connection. So that's really it, it's not hard at all. Um, the process usually takes between a year or two, depending on the specifics of the case, how complicated it is or not. Uh, but it's really not that hard. And the other, third reason why people are afraid to start their case with the Victim Compensation Fund is um, them thinking, okay, I only have acid reflex now, I don't want to start it now because what if I get cancer later and I need to get the money then? So. The Victim Compensation Fund is not like any other type of litigation. Once you get certified, you should start your case so that, you're, so that you don't miss it to your deadline. But as your case progresses, you are allowed to amend your claim to add on any new condition or any disability if you end up retiring for your illness. So even if you start your case for acid reflux, and regardless of whether it's over or not, but it's somewhere along the line, maybe you already paid for that. Two years later, you call me up and you're like, oh, actually, I just got diagnosed with cancer. The claim is reopened again. It's not a one-stop shop. 
it's the, the BCF recognizes that you know the health is a developing issue. It's not a car accident that's done and over. Illnesses come about as the years go by. So start your case. Once you're certified, register with the victim compensation fund. Start your case. Hopefully that's the only condition you ever have, but if it's not, you can add them on. God forbid, if you eventually pass away from your illnesses, your family will take it over and it will be a wrongful death case now. But the bottom line is that each one of those three big reasons I get, the novel one, I need the money, I did my job, it's too complicated, or I don't want to lose out on the money when I'm really sick, none of them is applicable. Now, in your folders, um, you have my card. If, you know, um, I've come across a lot of members who prefer to discuss the situation with males, especially if it's prostate cancer or whatnot. I understand that. There is the card of my coworker, Richard Alice. He is a retired deputy of the NY chief who works with us. Um, in here, you also have um, kind of a short questionnaire. If you, I'm, I'm available to talk to you now, publicly or privately, but if you want to call me later, you have my card. Also, if you just want to mail that short questionnaire to us and like to get a call at a later time, you could also do that. But um, either way, I'm here, I'm available for questions. We'll give you a free consultation um, if you'd like over the phone or in person, but you don't have to come to New York, although you're welcome. <laughs> uh, but either way, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the most important thing that I have for you is please spread the word and make sure you have good presence. Um, anybody have any questions? Do you guys take the cases on contingency? So uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, yes, so that is a, um, it's written in the statute. Mm -hmm. Every law firm is topped at 10%. It is a contingency. If we don't get your compensation, you don't, we don't owe us anything. Real quick, the last thing we're going to talk about is one of the 9-11 uh, foundations. It's called the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. It's in this pamphlet here. Tom and I were friends with Ray. Ray battled cancer for uh, about nine years. It's this little story in here. Uh, back in 2014 and 15, um, Ray Pfeiffer and John Stewart, the comedian, they would team up together. We would all go down to Washington, D.C. Uh, we were in numerous meetings um, trying to get co-sponsors for the 9-11 uh, Health and Compensation Act, which was fully funded until 2090. So then um, Ray got really sick and he got, uh, he was hospitalized and he eventually <laughs> passed away um, Memorial Day weekend, 2000 and, I gotta read my glasses, uh, 2017, sorry. Uh, keep Ray with me every day. So a group of us um, started the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. Ray was always big about giving back. One thing he did before he passed away, he bought a, a van with a wheelchair lift for guys who were sick from the fire department, take them to and from their, um, from their appointments. So Ray was always about giving back, so we're keeping Ray's name alive. What this foundation does is if you need any special medical equipment that's not covered under the Zadroga bill, we will pay for it. Um, what we do not do is we do not reimburse, but we will buy it for you. We will have it shipped to your house. Uh, some examples that we've, uh, items we've purchased, wheelchairs, electric scooters, um, stair lifts going up to second and third floors, ramps, railings, um, hospice care. When it gets to that point where somebody's going to be put in the hospice, sometimes the 911 health care bill does not pay for more than four hours a day or up to 20 hours a week. We will come in and we will pay the rest for you so you don't have to spend any of your money. It's good to see that everybody here is, you know, may not need something now, but even if you do, don't hesitate. My phone number is on the business card here. Even though it says the Feel Good Foundation, I'm a board member of the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. We will not turn anybody away who needs something. 
The only thing is it has to be an illness covered by the 911 healthcare. Um, you know, so if you broke your leg uh, running, doing something else, that's not covered. But um, this is a great organization because it helps out a lot of people. Um, hospice, we've paid over uh, one person, we paid over $10,000 for it. That would have had to come out of the family's pocket. And that's what we're trying not to do. It's a bad enough time when somebody's, you know, on their last week and then the family has to worry about where's the money going to come from. So um, don't ever hesitate. All, all you have to do is pick up the phone, call me. I'll email you an application to the foundation. Just answer it, send it back to me. We'll take care of the rest, tell me what you need. So um, this is a very good organization as well. He's still helping people and he's not here. He's up there, but he's not standing in the room with us. So he's still helping people even though he passed away. And Ray was a great man, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Funny guy. He came down here for a stair climb uh, three or four years ago. Yeah. yeah. He was uh, the, uh, the, the speaker? Um, Guest of Honor. Guest of Honor, he was, down in Dallas a few years ago. So, And he made a lot of friends down here. So. Um, don't ever hesitate, eat something. Email me, call me, do both, get a hold of me. Make sure we help you.